Welcome to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show, a real estate investment program. Listen and learn how to use real estate to build wealth and passive income streams for you and your family. We bring you experts every day to discuss and answer your questions on everything from single family homes all the way up to 600 plus unit apartment complexes. And now, the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Al Gordon, and as always, we're working on your financial freedom. As a matter of fact, I got a lot of things going on right now that are designed to help you with your financial freedom. That's why I exist. I exist to help you understand that there is a better way to achieve a very particular goal in your life. A very, very important goal in your life. A goal that, to be honest with you, people blow off. Yeah, people blow this goal off. Now, the people that don't blow off the goal, they'll make the goal, and then they'll lose focus. They will completely lose focus of the goal. They will forget that they set that goal. They'll forget that they actually set objectives that would help them get to that goal, and they don't get there. Because they got distracted. They got distracted. Something else came along. It took their attention. And that's what became important to them at that time. Now, that one thing I'm talking about, and those of you that listen to the show all the time, you know exactly where I'm going. Yeah, it's retirement. It's retirement. It's that place somewhere in the future that you're eventually going to get to. And you know you've got a plan to get there because you've heard plenty of stuff about how retirement isn't just a cruise control thing. Maybe you sat down with a financial planner and that financial planner said, hey, man, we'll get you all dialed in 30 to 45 years. You're good to go. And a lot of you, you bought into that. I'm no different. Trust me, I'm no different. I bought into that in my 30s. And it blew up in my face in my 40s because of what was going on in the marketplaces. And because I did exactly what I told you maybe you're doing. I lost focus of that goal. I lost focus of all the objectives that were supposed to lead me to that goal because I served in the United States Army for 27 years. The last half of my career, I was at war because the United States was attacked on 9-11. Yeah, so that became more important to me than something called retirement. My line of work, in the back of my mind, I was going, hey, I ain't going to be around for retirement because I'm going I'm to step on the landmine. I'm going to get hit by the IED. Something's going to come in from the air and land in my compound and inviscerate me. That was always in the back of my head. So retirement was like, ah, I'm getting a pension, man. I should be good to go with that, right? Except when it was time for me to retire from the Army, which was the Army's choice, not mine, I'd earned that pension. And that pension still pays me every day. But I can't afford to live off that pension. No, because my quality of life is a lot different than what that pension can actually provide for me. See, what I had to do was I had to refocus myself on retirement because I found myself in this really weird place. I mean, this is a weird place. Physically retired, but not financially retired. I've got this thing on my wall. There it is right over there. Certificate of Retirement from the United States Army, March 1st, 2014. That certificate right there says, I'm retired. And on March 1st of 2014, I was scrambling. I was scrambling because I didn't have enough money to support my household. Yeah, it was, it was a different kind of Armageddon for me. Yeah, there was nobody shooting at me. There was nobody trying to blow me up anymore. Except I couldn't sustain my household. For a guy like me, 
who has, okay, I got a little bit of an ego problem. I do, I do, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes that ego gets the better of me. But so a guy with my ego who finds himself at the age of 50 unable to, to provide for his family, man, I'll tell you, you want to talk about a gut punch? I was a gut punch. And I realized that, oh man, I'm a lot older than I was way back when, you know, I found a financial planner in my 30s and then gave him up in my 40s. And now I'm in my 50s, and I'm really not any closer to retirement than when I started this whole darn journey, although I do have this pension. Now what? Now what do I do? Okay, well, I did what most retirees from the military do. We go back into the workforce. They find a way into the workforce. Now, it's some people go back to the military-industrial complex. I have a lot of friends that, that are serving as contractors right now in support of the military forces. But that wasn't for me. I, I was done with all that. So I had, I had to find a different way into the workforce. And then when you, when you lay out your, your resume and you have 27 years experience of killing the bad guys and breaking their toys, you have to figure out a way to articulate that in a resume to employers so that they can understand that maybe you're viable. At the end of the day, I fixed my problem. Now, I didn't do it by myself. I had a lot of help. Because trust me, I needed a lot of help. I was what we used to call in the military a soup sandwich. Yeah, now imagine a soup sandwich. Get two pieces of bread. I don't care, white, wheat, whatever you want. Put them on a plate. Now pour soup over them. What do you have? Yeah, you have a mess. You have a mess. Now, that's kind of where I was at. I was really thinking I was going to work until the age of 70, and I was going to collect that Social Security check at the age of 70. And hopefully, with that second pension I, I was trying to earn, maybe I'd be able to live out my golden years. And then along came Del Wamsley, and he wrecked that plan. And I'm so thankful for it. When we come back from the break, I'm going to tell you about Jason. Stick around. Welcome back to the show. All right, so I actually have a huge treat for you. Now, the treat is not going to occur today. It's, it's not going to occur today. I'm going to actually hold this treat off until next week. I am. I'm going to hold it off until then. Because next week, I'm going to, I'm going to bring a gentleman onto the show. His name's Jason. Now, Jason, he's a fellow Lifestyles Unlimited member. And this is a guy that grew up in Southern California. Now, he's, he's younger than I am. I, I believe he's in his 40s. I might have that a little bit wrong, but I'll tell you what. When I bring him on the show next week, we'll ask him that question. Because here's why I'm bringing Jason on the show. In 1991, Jason bought his very first rental property. He did. In 1991, he bought his very first rental property in a place called Aliso Viejo, California, which rhymes with a very expensive place to live. Yeah, it's, it's a pricey place. And he bought this place in 1991. Now, he's a younger man at that time. He had never heard of Lifestyles Unlimited, but he felt that if he was going to get to where he was trying to get to, as far as wealth building and retirement, he probably ought to take some of his hard-earned money and put it into real estate. And he did. So he bought this little property, single-family property, and he held it. And he operated it. And we're going we're gonna to talk to him about, you know, what was that like? Did it cash flow? Did it not cash flow? Because I, I want you to understand what was going on in this young man's mind when we bring him on next week. And even better, he eventually got to a place in the future, or I should say, grammatically correct, he arrived at a place in the future where he sold that property. He netted $257,000 in capital gains. You heard me correctly, $257,000 increase in valuation on that property. Now, 
you have to understand that he bought this property in 1991, a long time ago. And he actually held this property for a kind of a long period of time. And then he eventually sold that property and he realized a $257,000 profit. It's pretty good stuff, huh? So what did he do? Well, he decided in 2004 that after watching TV, maybe like you or someone in your family does, and he was watching HGTV. I think they're relabeling that to Magnolia Net- Network. Did I see that correctly? Anyway, but well, just just goes to show that Chip and Joanna Gaines, they've created such a market force for what they do. They now control their own network. So Jason decided that he was going to do the Chip and Joanna thing, and he was going to flip a property. And he did. He flipped a property in 2004 in a place called Rancho Cucamonga, California. Now, I, I got to stop right there because I got to tell you, Rancho Cucamonga is where my children were born. Both of my children were born in Rancho Cucamonga. It is east of Los Angeles. So it's, it's more of that Inland Empire area. And in 2004, Jason bought a house there and he flipped it. And he made $30,000 on that particular property. Jason kind of stopped at that point, And we'll ask him why he stopped at that point. Because in 2005, he changed his investing strategy. He did. He completely changed what he was doing. Now, you're probably wondering, so what is it? What, what did he do? What did he do? Well, he found himself no longer in California. He found himself in Texas. He was actually up in the Austin area. And what he started doing was he started buying residential income producing real estate. The real kind. Not, not the first one that he bought that he owned and operated for a long period of time that he made a lot of money off of because the property was in California. Not a flipping thing like he did in Rancho Cucamonga where he made $30,000. But here's, here's the thing that I'll teach you on those, those flipping shows. Most of that profit gets sucked up by taxation. You didn't know that, did you? Because, because they don't teach you that on HGTV. They don't teach you that on DIY networks and to be Magnolia Network, do they? No. Here's what happens. So when you flip a property, whatever gains that you make on the property, because it's classified as a short-term sale, it's not a long-term hold investment. The IRS is very, very particular about this stuff. As a matter of fact, all the tax laws are written specifically based on whether you hold real estate for a short term or a long term. As a matter of fact, any investment is pretty much classified that way by the IRS. Yeah, there's short-term capital gains, there's long-term capital gains. Yeah, you get that in the stock market. So one of the things that, that Jason experienced was a lot of taxation. I mean, you think about it. Okay, I sold the house, I made $30,000, and you're thinking, oh, okay, great. Well, the worst I'm going to do is I'm going to pay long-term capital gains taxes. Now, I don't know what those were in 2004, but they would have been more preferential to the fact that Jason, I think, was making very good money back in 2004. So that $30,000 was considered ordinary income, so it was added on to what he earned in his job, and he was taxed as ordinary income. Oh, because the IRS says if you're flipping property and you don't hold that property for at least a year and a day, you're self-employed, and now you are subject to self-employment taxes, which are 15.3%. Yeah, it's, it's not only the half you pay, but it's the half the employer pays because you're self-employed. You are the employer. Therefore, you get the opportunity to pay both, both sides. Isn't that wonderful? So, 2005, Jason does something a little different. And he's in Texas. And he buys a fourplex. He buys a fourplex. And he owns and operates it. And this time... When he sells the property later in time, he has a 
and 66% gain on the property. A 566% gain on the property. He told me he made $334,000 in capital gains on that property. $334,000 on that particular property. That's a game changer. That's, that's way better than what he did in California, and he did it in Texas. Wait a minute, you're not supposed to do that in Texas. Oh, yeah? Well, stick around, because i got a whole lot more to share. Welcome back to the show. So, Jason, a fellow Lifestyles Unlimited member, younger than me, gets relocated from Southern California to a place called Austin, Texas. And he decides to dial in to his real estate investing strategy. He decides to to stop doing what most investors do that invest in California real estate, which is throw your money in there, hope that you can keep the deal together for however long you're going to hold that property because you're going to be rewarded by that property going up in value exponentially faster than just about everywhere else in the United States. So people that invest specifically in California, they don't necessarily invest for cash flow. They usually invest just for the appreciation. And they're they're satisfied with just that appreciation. Now they they also get the benefit of depreciation and things like that. But most of those investors they're they're either all cash investors, meaning they're they're basically working off of a, a cap rate as far as returns when it comes to cash on cash returns, or if they're leveraged, they have a lot of dead equity in the property because what they're trying to do is they're trying to keep the property at least at break even cash flow so they don't have to keep digging into their own personal pocket to support that property each and every month that they have a resident living in it. Now, Jason comes to Texas. Things are a little different in Texas. Investing is a little bit different in Texas than it is in California. Because all of a sudden, you start looking around in Texas, and when you start running your numbers on properties, something magical occurs. Something very magical occurs. What you find is that When you leverage your properties with the maximum amount of leverage that you can take on those properties, which is usually about 75%, sometimes 80%, but usually 75%. So you're only coming in with 25, maybe 20% down, right? Plus your closing costs. And here's the miraculous thing that happens. You start getting something called cash flow. It's, It's a weird thing. All of a sudden, your properties start paying you each and every month. There's extra money left over. What? Extra money left over? Yeah, that's that's the big difference between investing the California way and investing, say, the rest of the country way. Yeah, we'll just call it the rest of the country way. It's not just Texas that cash flows. There's a lot of places in the United States that cash flow. Now, there are people out there that would would poo-poo that, and they would go, oh, Al, but you don't understand, Al. If you're going to take that cash flow, Al, and you're going to, you like the sarcasm in my voice? I'm having fun with it. Okay, so anyhow, what they're saying is if you're going to take that cash flow and you're going to put maximum leverage on that property, you're going to be the recipient of mediocre appreciation because that's what happens in the rest of the country. That real estate is not as desirable as California real estate. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm looking at uh, Jason's list of properties that he has here. Now, here's here's what I want to tell you about Jason. And and I'll be honest with you. What What I'm talking to you about right now is specifically his single family portfolio. Yeah, I'm talking about Jason's 
single family portfolio experience. Now, Jason at one time had like 23 single family properties. Single family, by the way, is a collection of actual single family where you just have one resident living in the building or duplexes or triplexes or fourplexes. Anything that is one to four units is classified as single family property. Anything five units or more, well, that's multifamily. That's that's actually considered commercial real estate, which single family is not considered. And there's there's a lot of nuances in there as to why one's one way and why one's the other way. Okay, let's just get on past that. Really, the bottom line is this. With commercial properties, the properties are operated like a business is operated based on a profit and loss. In single family properties, the properties are essentially operated in a similar way, but when it comes to valuation, valuation is, is calculated completely differently. I, I explained it on yesterday's show. I'm not going to do it again today. Jason blew up that bad stinking thinking that California investors tend to have. He did because he kind of had it too when he came to Texas because this is, this is what he knew. This is what he knew. He understood real estate from a very localized perspective called Southern California. And then he transplants himself to a place called Texas. And now real estate is still local, but it's a different kind of local. It is a different kind of local. And in Texas, not in every market of Texas, and I'll I'll explain that in a moment, but in Texas, you have usually what I call a perfect alignment of what property values are worth in comparison to what those properties can rent for. And as a result of that ratio actually matching up pretty nicely, you can go in and acquire a property. You can put 20, 25% down. You can take out maximum leverage on the property. That property will still most likely cash flow for you. And the cash flow is going to be offset by the depreciation write-offs that you take. So you're really not going to, well, I'm not going to say you're not going to pay taxes on the cash flow. I'm going to say the taxes are essentially offset. Yeah, that's that's the way it works. Because what happens, the way the taxing mechanism works is that taxing liability actually just kind of moves back to talk to your accountant. I don't want to play an accountant. I don't want to play a tax guy on the radio because I'm really not good at it. I'll just be honest with you. So Jason gets busy buying all kinds of single family types of assets. I mean, predominantly he was going after in the beginning duplexes. He decided, he figured out that if he had two doors instead of one door under a roof, he probably could get a little bit better cash flow. And he found out that he was right. So what did he do next? Well, he figured if he could get two doors, and it would be better cash flow than one door under a roof. What if he doubled that up? What if he went to four units? Four units under a roof. That might give him even better cash flow. And he went on a trend of buying a bunch of fourplexes, and every once in a while he would pick up a single family or a duplex along the way. So Jason was getting very aggressive. Well, I don't know if aggressive is the right. Well, okay, let's call it aggressive. He was getting aggressive with his investing strategy. And what he was figuring out was that he could take some of these assets that he held previously, that he had sold, and made all this money off of these assets. He could take this money And he could buy even more assets with that money. See, Jason, remember that house in Aliso Viejo? Remember, he made a quarter of a million dollars when he sold that property. Now, you got to remember, Jason was kind of a young guy, too. Yeah, young guys, unfortunately, when they get like a quarter of a million dollars in their hands, they might start thinking about, oh, I got to get the fancy car. I gotta get me that speedboat. I gotta get me some jet skis. I gotta spend it. 
That's not what he did. Well, he spent it, but he spent it on assets that changed his future. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to the show. So Jason, by the way, is going to be my guest next week. You really want to tune in and listen to the conversation we're going to have because I'm just going to tell you what's going to happen. Jason is going to share with you information that you need to hear. He's going to share with you information about how he changed the trajectory of his life and how he utilized real estate assets to get it done. And what I've been telling you about is just kind of the the beginning part of his investment journey. Back when he didn't necessarily have a super solid plan, he just knew that he needed to have real estate in his portfolio. That's that's pretty much where his mindset was at. And the reason I know this is because I know Jason. He's actually a personal friend of mine. Believe it or not, I met Jason four and a half years ago when I became a member of Lifestyles Unlimited. He was one of the first people that I introduced myself to when I went to a Lifestyles Unlimited event. And I found the guy just to be very, very humble, very intelligent, and also willing to help. Yeah, willing to help. He was willing to spend time with me and share information with me that I needed to hear as a, as a new Lifestyles Unlimited member from a more seasoned member. Somebody who had been a couple miles ahead of me on this walk. And trust me, Jason is well more than a couple of miles ahead of me on the walk. Let me be real clear with you. I'm older than he is. That's a fact. I learned things from a younger man. That's a fact. Jason has taught me things. That's a fact. So if you've got an ego problem where you're thinking, okay, I can't learn anything from a young buck. Oh man, you need to, you need to wreck that. You need to destroy that, that false belief because that is a, that is a bad one to have in your arsenal. You can learn from anybody, believe it or not. You just have to be open-minded and you have to do like I have to do sometimes take that ego and put it in your back pocket. Oh, I hate doing that. But you know what? Sometimes that's what you got to do. So let's get back to Jason. So he had acquired 23 single family properties over a, well, a a pretty long period of time. Now, I actually have to tell you, we almost have to throw out that first property, that first one he bought in California back in 91, because he didn't do squat for 13 years. Yeah, let me say that again. He didn't do squat for 13 years. He bought a house, and that's all he did. Then in 2004, he's watching all the flipping shows, and he goes, I got some money. I could go do that. And he went and did that, and he made some money off of that. And he got taxed pretty heavily because that's what happens. 2005, he winds up at a place called Texas. And... Ironically, when you come from Southern California in 2005 and you're looking around Austin, Texas, and you're going, man, the real estate here, this stuff is dirt cheap. It is dirt cheap. And especially compared to what he had experienced in Southern California with pricing, you come to Texas and you go, man, everything's on sale. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? Why is it so discounted? There's got to be something wrong with it. No, there's nothing wrong with it. It just has to do with how the different markets operate. That's all it has to do with. So in 2005, he bought one property. 2006, he bought two properties. 2007, he bought one more property. And then you know what he did? Nothing. He did nothing. For five years. Makes you wonder why. Why do you think he did nothing for the next five years? Well, here's why I think he did nothing for the next five years. Because I think the money that he had made off of that first property, that allowed him to buy all those additional properties. And all those additional properties 
when he acquired them, consumed all that money. Totally fine. Nothing wrong with that. It's called reinvestment. Then he got to a place in 2007 where he picked up his last property and he ran out of money. He, he's what we call real estate rich, cash poor. And that's exactly where you want to be because your money cannot make money for you if you don't have your money working for you in an asset. That's the way it works. So Jason is just kind of hanging out. He's just kind of hanging out. Oh, something else happened during that time period. So remember I told you he bought his last property in 2007? Yeah. Remember what happened in 2008? Yeah, the first of all, it started off in 2007 with the stock market melting down. And then 2008, because of all the subprime lending garbage that went on, because the government did what the government did and allowed things to happen that, you know, people were getting 107% loan to values on properties with, with no income or credit or, or any verification. I mean, the market, it was the wild, wild West. I mean, I lived through those days. And I, I, I didn't even understand what was going on. I was watching it going on around me. I didn't understand how people were making all this money, but I also realized that I had bought a house in, I think it was 2003 three that I paid like 300,000 for. And in 2005, I sold it for close to a half a million. Yeah. That property went up $200,000 because what was going on in that time period, Jason had put all of his money to work before the meltdown happened. So all of his money was invested in these assets and then the meltdown hit. And you're probably thinking, uh-oh, that's not good, is it? Well, actually, it wasn't bad. And here's why. Jason had assets that were cash flowing. In other words, they were providing him positive income streams every month, and he did not have to go to work to get those income streams. He had already set everything up when he acquired the property, rehabbed the property, and found the right resident to live in it. That process right there created those income streams for him. And in, during the entire meltdown period, Jason made money. Now, he didn't make money off of his assets by selling them. There was no increase in price. There was no appreciation because it took a while for the markets to recover, remember? Remember? It took a while, but at the end of the day, because he had acquired these properties correctly, even though the market was in a huge uphill climb and then the market adjusted and went down on him and he didn't do anything wrong. He didn't do anything wrong. That's just what the markets did because he was positioned correctly in those assets. He was able to maintain ownership in those assets because those assets were producing income streams for him. He was making money in a down real estate market. Now I will tell you this, and I'll, I'll probably ask Jason this next week. He's probably wishing he had some of that money or at least had access to additional money. Because real estate went on sale. In 2008, 2009, you know, after the markets just peaked and, and the meltdown occurred, Jason could have bought a lot more real estate. And he could have done the exact same thing that he was doing. The difference is the asset was going to cost him less. But he didn't have the available liquid cash to do that. Now, it's very possible he might have thought... I'm not so sure about what's going on with the real estate markets. Maybe, maybe his game plan was, let's just ride it out. And when it recovers, we'll go back to work. There's no right or wrong solution for what he did. Now, I will tell you this. What Jason did is what Jason did, because that's a matter of timeline fact. We can't go back and change anything that he did. But Jason is a guy that endured 
a real estate downturn. And because he was doing things correctly when it comes to investing, he was successful. He was absolutely successful. Now, part of the reason I bring this up is because I know you read the news. I know you're looking at all the stories out there. I mean, there's one pundit after another that has been predicting the collapse of the real estate markets since the pandemic began. And what has the real estate market's response been? Yeah, I don't think so. Real estate market's been uber strong. Uber strong. But what if it collapses tomorrow? Do you know how to make money in an up or down market like Jason does? Well, I know I do. I know my Lifestyles Unlimited friends do. And I want you to know how to do it too. Go to lifestylesunlimitedworkshops.com. When you get there, sign up for a free workshop. We have got to get you going. The Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show constitutes an endorsement recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.